For this next 15 minutes, we're going to focus on how, when, and why to use intravascular imaging in the cath lab. So the first question is how. And the problem really begins at this stage with intravascular imaging. If you look at it as in its totality, it's actually extremely complicated. There are terms thrown around like grayscale and minimizing artifacts, sheath material, pulse shape, pulse duration, and length. But these terms are really for the engineer, not for the interventional cardiologist. Instead, imaging for the interventionalist is actually extremely simple and divided into three straightforward protocolized approaches. The pre-intervention assessment, where we assess the plaque composition, identify the reference segments and choose the stent size. The stent deployment, where we deploy from normal to normal, and then determine our expansion, and then the complications in post-procedural assessments, looking for problems in the stent and problems in the edges. So the benefit of assessing plaque composition in the current era of intravascular imaging is the ability to see all layers of the artery wall. Here you can see an OCT and high definition IVUS of 60 megahertz showing all three layers and the ability to detect um, these layers allows you to make decisions with regards to image interpretation. When the external elastic lamina or media and the adventitia can be visualized on OCT, this is a normal artery or fibrous plaque. If there's a signal change present in the lumen or the wall, if it's in the lumen and it's high backscatter, meaning most of the light is attenuated, this is red thrombus, but low backscatter is white thrombus. If the signal change is in the wall and it's high backscatter, this is lipidic, meaning the lipidic plaque is absorbing all of the light. If it's low backscatter, this is calcification, more as though the light hits something like a crystal and then refracts. And if you want to know which one of these it is, if you ask yourself, can you draw an outline around this signal, this helps identify whether it's low or high um, attenuation. And so OCT image interpretation as a result can be very simple and divided into these four or five relatively simple parameters that can guide intervention. And I think that that's one of the advantages of OCT over IVUS, where image interpretation is much easier due to the improved resolution. For example, you can see that dissections are much more difficult to identify using intravascular ultrasound than by OCT because of the superior resolution. Does it really matter? Does a plaque morphology matter? Well, it does, because you can see that in direct stenting approaches, you may have an improved outcome, whereas if you identify moderate to severe calcification, Treating patients without adequate vessel preparation can lead to very poor outcomes. The next thing to do is identify the reference segments. So the angiogram is severely limited in these situations. Why? Because where we normally land the stent in the proximal or distal reference by the angiogram, there's usually a significant amount of plaque burden by the ibis. The OCT eliminates this. And the way it does it is by identifying for you on an automatic measurement where the real lesion is and allowing to look at the cross section of the artery to determine whether or not this would be a place where you would normally want to land your stent. Here at the distal reference, you can see lipidic plaque. And as a result, the stent should be moved distally until a more normal segment of artery is identified. Of course, the other thing with vessel and uh, normal reference vessel segments is being able to identify whether or not it's normal. And one of the advantages that has been postulated in the past is that it's easier to see on intravascular ultrasound the entire vessel, but not on OCT. But actually, in reality, this is not the case. In a randomized controlled trial, we identified the reference segment, the ability to detect the border of the vessel, in the same percentage by IVUS and by OCT. But here's the problem. The problem with IVUS currently has been that despite using the intravascular imaging, we haven't been able to co-register it to the angiogram. And after doing your pullback, we land in the position where, where am I? Am I close to the septal? Am I close? How far am I away from the septal or from the diagonal? Where should I actually land my stent? And the advantage of OCT, of course, is that angiographic co-registration allows you to look at the artery from the outside in and the inside out with great precision. Here you can see angiographic co-registration, which identifies the lens of the OCT, allowing us to look at the artery in great detail, ultimately performing stenting within a standard deviation of one millimeter of geographic miss. 
What about choosing stent diameter? Well, let's look a little bit about IVUS and OCT so far. The first randomized controlled trial of IVUS versus OCT guided PCI was performed in only 70 patients in a crossover design. What happened in this situation is that IVUS was, stenting was performed according to the vessel wall and OCT was performed according to the lumen. And if the lumen could not be clearly identified according to the angiogram. So you can see in the OCT arm, it's decided by angiography in 37% and only 63% by the lumen. But by IVUS, it's decided by the wall 100% of the time. And strictly as a result of a change in the original sizing, you can see that the IVUS leads to a significantly increased stent area compared to OCT. The stent deployment pressures, post-dilation, and post-dilation pressure were also significantly higher. Illumian 1 was an interesting study of registry design where FFR and OCT was performed in every single case, and we found some interesting things similar to what was presented earlier with the ripcord study. But one of the most interesting findings of Illumian was, was in fact, that in 31% of OCT, OCT uh, cases led you to choose a smaller stent size. Now there's very few situations in interventional cardiology where we should be planning to use a smaller stent diameter. The only one that I can think of is to try to prevent making a hole. So if we look at this in more detail, we find something very unique. In the Illumian 1 study, you could either have pre or post OCT imaging, post only, or a combination of the above. And you'll notice in those patients who had no OCT imaging compared to those who had OCT before and after, the stent is significantly larger in the no OCT group. And what that's telling us is that the OCT is so accurate and precise that it's even more accurate than when you were trained by your trainer about what size a stent actually is. What do I mean? This is a case from Illumian 3 where we performed quantitative coronary angiography and identified the reference vessel diameter of 2.4 millimeters. At the same time, if we perform lumen-guided PCI, we have almost exactly the same numbers. But if we're going to use the lumen, then why not just use the angiogram? What advantage does the OCT have in that situation? And this is the reason why it's been difficult to prove improved outcomes in simple, straightforward patients using intravascular imaging. But let's take a different example where OCT-guided lumen stenting can be at deleterious rather than a neutral. Here's a reference vessel diameter on coronary angiography of 2.6 millimeters, but on OCT, the lumen is actually only 2.25, and the vessel wall is 3.25, and a vessel-guided approach would lead this to be 4.3 millimeters squared larger. So by the take-home messages, you do not size the stent by OCT using the lumen. It must be done according to the wall. Why? The reason is because if you use the wall, you put in a bigger stent, and that's the hallmark of a long-term success for PCI. And I've shown this slides before, but ultimately the other difference is that IVUS compared to OCT oversizes the artery. OCT is precise and accurate, and the result of this is clinically impactful. So if we have a histologically three millimeter vessel, the OCT tells us it's a three millimeter vessel, but the exact same patient imaged exactly the same time by IVUS, the IVUS tells you it's 3.3 millimeters. As a result, you choose a larger stent diameter. The larger stent diameter leads to a better outcome. Size, in fact, does matter. The longer the stent and the smaller the diameter, the less likely you are to have a successful outcome. Second generation drug eluting stent technologies taught us that a minimal lumen area of 5.3 was ideal. Well, actually, that's not the case. This is really the point at which the sensitivity and specificity cross over. And it's not until you get to about 6.8 millimeters squared where you plateau on the benefit of imaging guidance. This is the OCT Illumian 3 stent sizing algorithm where we focus on using the external elastic lamina rather than the lumen to guide sizing. And here you can see an example of external elastic lamina guided stenting. The OC tells you exactly how long the lesion is and as a result provides optimization. This is why choosing OCT by the external elastic lamina is the only way to compete with IVUS. Assessing stent expansion is also critically important. There are multiple methods to do this. By biological vessel tapering, um, we divide the stent in half. 
The advantages of OCT compared to IVIS in this situation, of course, that OCT provides automatic measurements. How do you do this? You do this by simply placing your reference segments at the area of your interest and all of the measurements are automated. Here you can see the minimal lumen area in your, in your stented segment and the respective reference or residual diameter stenosis. And so you can do this for the entire stent length in extremely rapidly and quickly. Angiographic co-registration allows us to therefore do this with extreme precision, um, identifying our reference segments uh, at, a, at a great degree of detail. So what did Illumion 3 teach us? Illumion 3 taught us that the post-PCI minimal stent area by OCT only matches IVUS if we use an external elastic lamina guided approach. But we also learned that secondary endpoints, which included the minimal stent area, minimal stent expansion, mean stent expansion, were all better with imaging guidance compared to angiography guidance, and you were more likely to achieve optimal expansion using imaging guidance than by angiography alone. Here's an example of where an angiogram misses an edge dissection. This is a patient who has a distal RCA lesion, and you can see that on the OCT, which was done to perform expansion, you can see that there's a significant intramural hematoma. And these types of hematomas actually are what are, are clinically relevant. An intimal tear is likely unlikely to cause a clinical significant impact, but a medial dissection and intramural hematoma clearly need. Dissections were significantly more common in the IVUS group compared to the OCT-guided arm. And in fact, even in the IVUS-guided arm, OCD detected 24% of dissections that were completely missed by IVUS. Why is this important? It's important because this is an independent predictor of drug-eluting stent failure or problems with the edge. Apposition is also easy to determine with OCT. There's an automated apposition indicator which identifies for you exactly where the malapposition is. Again, major malapposition was more common in IVUS and angiography arms compared to the OCT-guided arm. And in the IVUS arm, the final blinded OCT detected missed malapposition in 20 and major missed malapposition in 7%. Tissue protrusion is also significantly more commonly missed by, OCT, by IVUS compared to OCT. So when should you use this? I'll end this in my last two minutes. When should you use intravascular imaging? Well, really, you already know which patients are the most likely to have a target vessel failure. If I went around the room and asked you which patients are most likely to have a stent failure, you would tell me diabetes, end-stage renal disease, previous stent failure, comorbidities necessitating the use of bare metal stent. And if we look at the risk factors for restenosis, you can see exactly which patients are most likely to benefit from imaging. And why should we do this? Because if you use intravascular imaging, you improve clinical outcomes. Not only in complex patients, in simple patients, all patients have a benefit from intravascular imaging guidance. So, in conclusion, angiography clearly has limitations. Intravascular imaging has become an integral part of interventional cardiology, and the choice of imaging modalities dependent upon the lesion and the question to be answered. Thank you very much.